Greetings, and bienvenue, mine crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. Here's a family tale I posted here last week. Bear with me because a lot of this is only half remembered, and all the information second, if not third hand. Shortly before I was born, my mom and dad were involved in some sort of crazy hunt for John Lafitte's treasure along the Gulf Coast of Texas. Apparently, my dad got pulled into it by several people he worked with. They pooled their money and basically financed about a three weeks time to chase some lead that one of the other guys had. So, big surprise, it didn't pan out like they hoped. The map that the leader of the whole shebang, Alan, had was nowhere near accurate and what landmarks it had no longer matched up to anything they were seeing, if it was even authentic at all. I remember my dad telling me that early on, he thought it was all just an excuse to go on a road trip to the beach and get shit-faced. Well, it turned out that, even if no one else was, Alan was serious. I don't know whose idea it was, but somebody got the bright idea to contact, in my dad's words, a medium. Who put them in touch with this old woman was the guy who owned the boats they'd chartered. Whoever that guy was, he obviously thought this old woman was the real deal, and it was pretty clear that she thought so too, because she wouldn't tell them shit until they agreed to give her a full cut of whatever they found. Once Alan agreed to that, she told the rest of the crew and all the rest of the come-alongs, wives, girlfriends, children, all told, I think it was about 25 to 30 people, to go back to the hotel and Alan would be along shortly. Apparently, the old woman didn't allow children, pregnant women, or pets to be around when she did her thing. Dad said Alan showed up at the hotel about three hours later, looking like he'd seen the devil himself, just went to his room without a word to anyone. When Dad went to ask him if he was okay, Alan told him that he knew where they were going, then added that once the old woman got to chanting, it sounded like every dog in the county set to howling. The next morning, Alan got everyone together at breakfast and told them that the place they were looking for was about another 30 miles down the coast, and that he'd been told to pick six men to come with him and everyone else was to stay behind. My dad was one of the seven that went on that dig. So, the seven of them set out in two vehicles, a truck with whatever half-assed digging tools they'd thrown together and a station wagon. Alan made a sort of surprise detour into a little town they passed along the way to stop at a Christian bookstore. When they stopped, the other guys were justifiably confused about what they were doing and he told them that the old woman had told him that every man who came along needed some sort of spiritual protection, like a Bible, a crucifix, whatever, just something they had faith in, and that they were to keep them on their persons at all times. Well, these were all guys from the deep south, so Bibles and crosses seemed a pretty safe bet. After Alan made sure that everybody had some form of protection, they set off again. When asked if they should be watching for landmarks, Alan just told them that when they got close, they'd all know. So off they drove, the day rainy and overcast with a big storm brewing out in the gulf. It was a grove of glowing trees that they saw. I don't know who was the first to spot them, but once Alan saw them, he was convinced, a little grove of trees sitting back maybe half a mile from the beach, glowing with foxfire. They got as close as they could in the station wagon, then prepared to transfer everything, men and gear, over to the truck. As they came to a stop in the car, they all became aware of a sound coming from the cargo area in the back. When they opened the back, they discovered the source of the sound to be a die-cast toy motorcycle scooting around on the top of a TV tray. The toy had no motor. Apparently, the two or three guys who saw that kept it to themselves. I'd love to be able to tell you what specific thing told them where to dig. Dad seemed to think it was nothing, that Alan just knew somehow. Whatever it was, they started to dig. And dig. And dig. Dad said that Alan was sort of manic about the whole thing. 
Not excited, exactly, more like he was nervous and impatient. Once Alan came clean, his mood made a lot more sense. They dug in shifts through the afternoon and as the light started to fail, Alan surprised them all by telling them that they'd be staying through the night. Well, all the guys had heard the weather reports on the radio, that Hurricane Celia was supposed to be making landfall somewhere in the Corpus Christi area, pretty much exactly where they were, and they all told him he was crazy if he expected them to stay out there. That was when Alan came clean with the rest of what he'd been told. The old woman had told him that the reason that Lafitte's treasure had never been found was because it moved, that Lafitte had had someone put a curse on it, or he'd done it himself, I can't remember, that any man who found its location had from one sunrise to the next to dig it up. My dad and two other guys told him that for no amount of money were they trying to weather a hurricane in a tent they picked up at Kmart and that they were getting out of there. Alan and the other three begrudgingly let them leave. One guy volunteered to drive them back to the hotel in the station wagon. The other three stayed right there and continued to dig their asses off. I should probably pause at this point to tell you a little something about the hole and the men digging it. When we think of buried pirate treasure, we tend to think of an oak chest buried four or five feet deep in the sand somewhere. That's exactly not the sort of hole these men were digging at Alan's instruction. No, this was more an impromptu mineshaft into the side of a small rise. These guys all worked in the mining industry and had either grown up listening to their father's stories about how they used to make their tunnels in the old days or else had dug a few themselves. One of the men who stayed behind definitely had. He was the oldest of the crew, somewhere in his fifties among this crew of twenty-somethings, and he'd graduated from working in the mines to a desk job. He'd listened to Alan's description of what they needed to do and sent the man he deemed most worthless after a list of supplies. As they dug, this old man saw signs that he was sure meant there had been a shaft filled in there before. My father saw some of this evidence, shards of old, rotted timber, primitive-looking spikes rusted down to almost nothing. These finds really fueled their hopes that they were chasing more than foxfire and a crazy old woman's word, so the four that remained dug just as fast as the old man would allow them to. By that afternoon, they'd sunk a shaft about two feet high, three feet wide, and about nine feet deep into the hillside, all the time thinking that next strike of the pick would meet with that satisfying thunk of metal biting into wood. It was around that time that Hurricane Celia came ashore. The winds and the rain had been getting steadily worse throughout the day. My father and the rest of the men who opted out of insanity had made it back to the hotel around two that afternoon. They tried to convince the owner of the station wagon to stay but he was hearing none of it, and it's through him that my father heard most of the rest of this story. The rain was coming down in solid sheets by then, and had he been on the road in anything other than a cool two tons of rolling iron, he'd have probably not made it back, but make it back he did. He'd no more than pulled up than two of the remaining three men at the dig site piled into the car and told him to get them the hell out of there. In the almost two hours he'd been gone, the old man and worthless, I think, had decided against trying to stick things out. According to them, Alan came unglued. He told them that they could all go to hell as far as he was concerned and that if nobody cared about the money, he'd stay and keep it all for himself. Wagon man decided he'd make an attempt of his own to reason with Alan, but after Alan brandished a shovel at him and told him to get his chicken shit ass off his dig, that was all it took to decide Wagon Man that the other two had the right idea, so they left to find whatever shelter they could. It was an old couple, the owners of the property for all I know, who took them in for the night. As you'd probably guess, they were hesitant to tell the old folks what they were up to. It was the old miner who finally came clean. The old couple told them that they were damned fools to be off chasing after treasure in a hurricane, and other than the terrible storm, the night passed without incident. No one will ever know for sure what happened to Alan that night. The rest of this comes from Wagon Man and Old Miner as related to me by my father. 
At first light, wagon man and old miner set back out in the station wagon to find Alan, picking their way through the debris as best they could. When they arrived at the dig, they knew it was going to be bad, trees down all over the place. They parked the wagon and made their way up through the trees on foot. As they reached the camp, the first thing they saw was the pickup crushed beneath a tree. They hurtled downed trees and ran to it, fearful of what they'd find inside. It was empty. None of the tents were anywhere to be seen. It was then that they turned their attention to the shaft. Old miner yanked the truck's glove box open, pulled out a flashlight, and told wagon man to wait by the truck. He knelt down before the hole and shined the light up inside. After a moment, he called out to Alan twice before reaching inside and beginning to tug. Come help me get him out, he said. As wagon man approached, he saw something laying in the dirt that the other man had missed, a glint of gold, Alan's crucifix and the broken necklace on which it had hung. What they pulled out of that hole was barely recognizable as their friend. His legs, back, and face had all been horribly clawed, as if something had forced its way up between his back and the low ceiling of the tunnel. Despite the lacerations to his face, his eyes were intact and bulging with terror and pain. Old Miner told the younger man to go fetch the authorities and break the news to the rest of the crew, and under no circumstances was he to let Alan's girlfriend come out and see him like this. According to my dad, Old Miner was a real class act really took charge and acted as a sort of shield for the rest of the young treasure hunters. After the police were done questioning him, they pretty much gave everyone else involved only the briefest of hassles before letting them get on the road back home. My dad sent my mother on back with the rest and chose to stay behind with the old man till some of Alan's family could arrive to claim the body. The official cause of death was listed as shock brought on by animal attack, as his injuries, though horrible, weren't inflicted in areas that would have proven fatal. The old man, though tight-lipped about what he thought, seemed to have other ideas. On the trip home, he asked my father if Alan had ever told him why they needed their protection out at the dig site, to which my father replied that he had not. Alan had told the ones that stayed with him longest, it seems, and this is what that old man passed on to my father. That old witch told him we should keep our gods close, else old John gone come, show you all the horrors of hell. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes midnight central time.